I will now pass you into the very capable hands of Precious Oyelade. Thank you so much, Precious. conversation of the day and so I feel like you hopefully won't be bored of my voice uh, as it is but um, I thought because you know we're at this point in the day it might be good to start with a little activity so I would love to just see a show of hands so firstly like raise your hand if you have or are building a community from scratch Awesome. Strong show of community founders in the room. We love this. All right. Now, how many of you, like, raise your hand if you have community in your title and you're helping build something that maybe someone else originated? Awesome. Source. That's what I love to see. Less so, but I'm in your camp, people. I'm in your camp, so no worry not. Awesome. Then just one other uh, round of questions. Raise your hand if your community at present has sub 50 people. Awesome. 50 to 100. 100 to 200. Awesome. 200 plus. Oh, Titans. Titans in the room. Awesome source. Well, it's good to understand a bit more about who's in the room. Um, my name is Precious Ayolade. I'm currently the program lead at Google for Startups. And I'll give you a bit of my history later on. But um, essentially, it's a pleasure to be here. And the title of today's talk, as you can see, is Community, It's a Team Endeavor. And what do I really mean by this? What I mean is that whether it's your passion, because you're a community founder, or it's your day job, community I have found, having built communities essentially and sustained communities for other people, it can't be done in a silo. Everybody is one individual, and actually it takes a team, whether that's a team of community builders beneath you, a team of community builders alongside you, or a leadership team uh, above you or bes uh, beside you, you have to do uh, community in community. And what I hope to do today is give you a few candid takeaways from my experience of building communities that really demonstrates why, whether it's your profession slash job function, or whether it is your passion, that actually the buying and consistent involvement of other people on your team and in community is what is actually going to help your community thrive, but also you as an individual. Because I'm sure we've all heard about that wonderful but also terrifying term, burnout. And I feel like that is something that can be more consistent amongst community people for a number of reasons. So full disclosure, I'm speaking from a history where actually I didn't really understand what community meant. I'm one of those people who really started to understand the term in terms of community profession in that weird, weird year, 2020, when the COVID pandemic took uh, basically all of us inside. I started thinking about my history and then realized that actually I've probably been doing community at my core in everything I've done before. And I think a lot of us, when we think back about the things that we've been doing day in and day out, probably from when we left, I don't know, school, uni, just in life, have probably been building communities or helping sustain communities as members for a very long time. So I started off as an intern, I mentioned in the previous um, panel, actually uh, run, working for a church as a community action intern. And what that meant was I was coming together with people who had come out of homelessness and helping them connect with the right services and opportunities within a small town in, the, in England called Peterborough uh, to help them gain skills in order to find employment. Then I moved into running programs for teenagers. Now, let me tell you something. If I have ever seen work that is hard, it is running programs for teenagers who have been sent somewhere by their parents. <laughs> <laughs> and you're trying to get them to have fun. So actually, again, I'm in a space, I was in a space where you had people who were sent into essentially a gated community, right? People had paid to be there. And then part of the way that I was supposed to get them to participate was by getting to get them to know each other. And then boom, 2020, I entered the world of startups. That's what the explosion is, because I feel like that's where I'll stay for a while, you know? Uh, first, I started in telling stories. So I was working in PR and communications for African tech startups. And I started to work with a number of founders, helping them tell their stories to gain investment, talent acquisition, customer acquisition. And what was really interesting about that time was I wasn't I wasn't uh, satisfied with helping write press releases. What I was satisfied with was getting the different founders into Zoom rooms with each other. So I was remote before we were forced remote. Uh, into different Zoom rooms with each other in order to share their best practices about sharing their narratives 
uh, across the continent of Africa. And that's where I started to realize that actually helping founders help other founders was probably the sweet spot of any work that I did. And so I built a community telling stories by creating um, a PR-focused communications community for these African tech founders. That's when I moved into the official title of community manager. I joined the European Focus VC, and literally my job was community. And this is where my learnings around community as a team endeavor started to arise because I thought community was my job and my job alone. And actually it led me down a very interesting winding educational road, partly through on deck community builders where I met some of these fantastic people in the front row um, and partly through other learnings and readings that help me understand what it takes to, I think, sustain yourself as a community professional and actually having conversations with leadership at that fund in particular about how to support the people they brought on board to help build that community. And lastly, I'm back to running programs. However, in running the programs that I do at Google for Startups, again, I've come to recognize that regardless of the fact that community isn't in my job role, as program lead, as I was mentioning earlier, we have an alumni community where actually, regardless of what you want to put in terms of a title, it's really important for everybody on the team to be involved in building and sustaining that community in order that the people who are involved are actually gaining value and you're not just running around in circles doing things for the sake of it. So what I'm gonna do in this very short time is talk about some of my learnings from experience, some of my learnings from observation and some of my learnings from conversation. Um, and I just think it will be uh, a much easier way of um, taking you on a useful journey. So experience. As I said, when I um, entered into the world of startups, it was the first time I had community in my title. And it was a real big moment for me because I was like, okay, I have a big thing to do. This was a community that was gated in the sense that anyone who was part of it had been chosen and selected by someone else. It wasn't my job to put people into this community, but it was my job to get them to talk to each other, support each other and help each other. And I was like, I don't actually know that much about what any of these startups do at one time. And so trying to find the balance between finding out what these people did, finding out what they needed and finding out their history when there were 400 of them was a challenge in and of itself, especially when trying to deal with a pandemic myself, you know, speaking to people in different areas of Europe from your bedroom, it was a new experience for me. But what I did learn was that actually I could not rely on my own experience, my own knowledge and research without having conversations with the people who had tasked me with building this community. There were people at Seed Camp essentially who had been there since the start. And as um, Stephen was saying earlier, you know, you come to this point where actually there's a reason this community has been established. And if you're a community professional who hasn't done it before, I was very new to the game, actually, speaking more to those people and understanding what made the community work in the first place is a great way to begin them moving forward in helping the community to innovate. Um, and so my naivety in the beginning very changed very quickly because I realized I wasn't trying to create something new. I was trying to reignite and maintain something that already had a foundation, but I just needed to unearth. And that was a great learning experience for me because it meant that actually it made me more reliant on other people in a way that wasn't um, debilitating, but that was actually empowering. I realized that actually when it comes to um, building or helping sustain communities, actually it's, it's more important to work with other people um, than to think because it's my title, because I'm the founder, I'm the one with all the answers. Actually, there are a wealth of resources and one of the best resources that we have is people. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about uh, that experience. The next then was like observation. I think actually it's really, really important that um, we've been having these conversations about how community has risen to prominence in the last uh, like two years. Um, because for me, I was like, oh, this has been going on all the time. It's not true. And actually when I came to realize that it wasn't true in the sense that like, um, community is a very new thing and actually it's been going on for a long time. It helped me realize that all of these celebrities that I was looking at in terms of community building had, hadn't, hadn't um, come up overnight, but had been doing things for five to 10 years, as Rosie was saying. And actually thinking about it as a decades long work helped me take the pressure off myself. And working with other people, so looking at CMX, looking at On Deck, looking at all these other community support spaces helped me to realize actually that 
all these things that I was working on actually just needed to have the time uh, to mature and to uh, move forward. And so actually, I think for those of you who are community builders who have been employed to, to, to do community, obviously there is a passion there and it's a job there, but actually there's the work of doing the strategy, but there's also the work of doing the communication. So having more conversations with the leadership in the organization was something I probably didn't do. And having observed the conversations with other community builders um, in uh, the On Deck Fellowship and then moving forward in other spaces, actually that knowledge sharing is more about um, helping gain the language needed to communicate the value of the community and the benefits that are necessary um, in order to then move forward with making that work. And so I'd encourage everyone really um, to bear this in mind when moving forward, like taking the time to really work with more people in the team is probably top dollar. And then lastly, uh, conversation. So if I'm focusing on the fact that community is a team endeavor, I think we were talking about the basics before, right? Experimentation, we we're talking about like, don't fear the silence, right? You do an experiment, no one answers, it's okay. You can just go again. But of course, when you have silence in your team, what do you do? You've tried this thing, no one has really commented, you've put on an event, um, you've had people come, but actually what's the next step? Then actually I think there's a world in which we focus on the resources um, from the people in the room that ensure that we're getting support. So in my experience, I've had instances where I felt unsupported in the sense that you put on an event and leadership doesn't show up. Or you have a Slack channel and you may not have the answer because you're new, but other people in your team have the answer and you're the one who has to do the chasing of your team in order to get the answer in there. And yes, at first that makes sense because you know you have to do the things at scale, but actually moving forward, I think as I was making the point before, it's really important to have a diversity of voices within those channels for the community. If not, when one voice leaves, what are you left with? You're left with actually a gap because that work was the burden of one person. And actually, if you're talking about a community that's made up of an entire group of people, then hopefully everyone's contributing. Oftentimes, I've spoken to people who are building communities mainly for brands, um, and they've, they've reflected on the fact that um, community feels like the um, bolt-on that isn't really necessary, when actually it's the thing that can drive the, um, the business forward in uh, the most uh, specific, in the most uh, beneficial way. And so the last thing that I would encourage around conversation when it comes to community is simply this. Um, you, can have, you can talk to your team not only about what the community needs, but also what you need. And that's really participation. If your leadership in your um, company have tasked you uh, with community, or if you as a leader have tasked someone else with community, then you also need to be supporting that person with what they need in order to move the community forward. And actually, leadership are members of the community as much as any community leader, manager, or builder. Um, and so, yes, if I leave you with anything today, it's simply this. Make sure that when the community is thought of as a team endeavor, it's not just building a team underneath you, but beside you and above you as well in order to move forward uh, with that. Well, that's it for me for today. One of the, that's probably one of the speediest things you've ever seen. But you know what? I think we've had a lot of community conversations today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, mm. I know I said I didn't use the word Titan very often, but I think today calls for it to be used again. That was fantastic. Um, I have some questions for you here, so I'm just going to ask away if that's okay, and uh, we'll, we'll just work our way through. So I'll just start with this one here. Um, I'm looking for a role as a community manager. What questions should I ask my potential employer to make sure our community vision and ways of working align. Oh, amazing. That's one of the questions that I didn't ask when taking on the community role, and I wish I had. I think um, when looking for a role as a community manager, the first thing is uh, to ask someone is, what is the purpose of that community? Or what has, the commun what has been the purpose that the community traditionally served? And the reason I say that is because um, I've seen a lot of people who, like me, joined community management roles at the same time and then tried to get the community to do seven different things and felt like they weren't getting buy-in from their leadership. And the reason they weren't was because they'd misunderstood the task. They didn't engage firstly in the listening exercise with leadership, nor did they engage in the listening exercise with the, um, with the community themselves. So 
when asking a potential employer, I think the first is what has the community done previously? Mm -hmm. And what are you actually, like, why are you filling this role? What, what is the purpose you want the community to serve? Fantastic. So whoever asked that question, there, there's some help for you right there. Um, here, here's another one I'd, I'd like to ask. We've heard a lot about startup communities today, and I know you and I are quite biased towards that particular area, but um, what do you think communities for in a sort of larger, more incumbent organizational sort of situation look? Um, it does say in the next five years, but I think, you know, in as big a span as you as kind of want to cover. So startup communities are larger. Or, or just more incumbent communities. How do you think the future looks there? Uh, I think, yeah, I think they look like spaces in which actually people are going to look to bring in more diverse voices. I think even when you have a community, you will still have minorities within that community. And I guess I look more at that maybe because I'm like a black woman, but also like I have a friend, for instance, who's visually impaired. Mm. And so when I think about the conversations that I have with her, companies, even like Apple, for instance, that have, you know, communities that help them with their UX design, she's then, she will then bring up points such as, well, actually, Apple's probably the best um, company that has functionality for people who are visually impaired. However, there's this issue, that issue, and that issue. And so I think communities are going to start looking to improve um, features. They're going to start doing more outreach to improve features that serve sub-communities, but communities that are still underserved. Mm -hmm. And with startup communities, I think what you're then going to see is more um, communities being engaged and hired, people hired from those communities into the startups. So that actually the communities can be accelerated, even though you don't necessarily want to accelerate too quickly, mm. accelerated faster. That's a really <coughs> fascinating point and kind of leads into this next question that I think is really important to ask. Um, what do you think is a kind of the place and the role of things like diversity, equality, inclusivity in order to build communities more sustainably? going forward it's a core cool function i mean it's a, it's a core cool function of society so um or it should be a core cool function of society and i think actually when we look at conversations now around esg right everyone's talking about esg and actually there's been more of a focus on the e but actually when you look at the s um you see that diversity um and inclusion and e diversity equity inclusion actually has become more of a conversation because it's been left out in the past. So mm. actually, it just needs to continue to be built as the foundation, as a core pillar of any, any, any community that's built. Yeah, here, here. Um, I've been told off because I'm holding my microphone wrong. Hopefully this is a bit better and more jaunty. Um, what would be three top soft skills that you would say are needed? Is it, is it sort of stress soft skills here to be a good community manager? Oh, soft skills. Empathy, um, for sure. Um, oh my God, my mind has gone straight to hard skills because like, I'm just like very uh, execution oriented. So um, I would say empathy. I would say uh, the ability to network. Like if you, <laughs> and that doesn't necessarily mean being extroverted. I think sometimes people think that being extroverted uh, is the way to move forward in terms of soft skill. No, actually being able to um, just talk to people, core conversation is very, very important. Um, and the third soft skill, I don't know, come back to Good me. music taste for a <laughs> year event. Oh, I, I would be doomed if that was the case. No, actually, um, maybe thick skin. And I don't know if thick skin is, like, necessarily a soft skill, but, like, sometimes you do things that don't work and it can make you feel like, oh, a failure. And actually, no. Like, we actually just have to learn to experiment and iterate. So, yeah, thick skin. Yeah, it was being discussed earlier, you know, you're going to have that event, which is, like, the birthday party where no one rocks yeah, no up, one you know, and you've got to you got to be able to make it through that. And actually, this is cheeky, but I'm going to ask you a question of my own. What were the hard skills you were thinking about out of interest? Oh, time management. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, time management. Um, and actually, assertive, like, actually, assertive isn't a soft skill, but just the ability to say no. Hmm. The ability to say no. Um, and then also, yeah, know how to, like, a marketing background. Like uh, Charlie was saying earlier, like, knowing how to write copy that lands with people is just, like, and lands with a very specific audience will get you 10 times further. Like literally, especially working with founders, like your email subject mm. changes the game. Simply, an email subject will change your like open rate. And I didn't know that for a very long time. I need a notepad. No, that's, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, another wee question here that, that I think is really, really pertinent to what we're discussing today. Um, what do you think about the issue of community kind of overwhelming individuals, people who find themselves drawn to many different like silos and groups but they don't have time to contribute to all of them. What can we do as community managers or leaders to kind of support those people? Or is it just something where, you know, it's down to the individual? Yeah, to be perfectly honest, 
I don't think I have the answer to this because I'm probably one of those people that signs up to like 15 different communities. And the problem is like, I want to be involved because it's like, oh, you, you know, you answer my problems that I need with like, I have very like, you know, skin or hair, or I really want to learn about DAOs. Like it's, I don't think it's the job of community managers to lighten the load of how many communities there are. Although I do think we'll start to see community cross collaboration that benefits the majority of community members. But what we do need to do, harking back to what Marcella said earlier, is continue to ensure that that community adds value to those who are engaged. I think everyone is in a war for attention. Netflix is fighting for your attention. Google is fighting for your attention. Your family is fighting for your attention. But actually, if there is, like, if there is value or just simple joy, found in those spaces, then that's how community managers can support people who are overwhelmed, simply by providing value. I will pass you this mic to drop at some point. I won't actually because <laughs> it's, it's, it's not my mic and if it gets damaged, <laughs> I'll get in trouble. Um, that was no, powerful stuff. Um, I've had a couple of questions on the similar themes, so I just kind of linked them together. Um, kind of discussing the burnout, you discuss a little bit more, and I think especially when we link that to things like no one comes to your birthday party type deal, um, how do you manage that life work balance, especially when you know community can bleed into into your personal life in such a big way? And um, yeah, how do you manage that burnout when you're supporting a community? One person kind of mentions empathy overload being yeah. exhausting. I think recognize number one is recognizing your limits as an individual. I'm someone who thinks that I can fix everything for everyone, and coming to the realization that I can't. And then being able to say no is probably re like really helpful in terms of practically yes community can be on all the time but your phone doesn't have to be mm. legit like honestly one of my <laughs> this may sound terrible and i hope no one who's ever been part of a community that i've managed like feels away but sometimes airplane mode is your friend like even if it's just an hour of switching off so that you can stop t uh, take a step back and then come back and prioritize that's probably really helpful because actually you can't be your best self if you're running on empty. Mm -hmm. You can be your best self if you take time to stop and recharge. Like um, empathy is, is a great gift, but it also can like steal a lot from you. So yeah, being able to switch off at certain times, I think is probably the most helpful so that you can then go back refresh. It's like a computer. Sometimes it's malfunctioning. Just switch it off and turn it back on again. Mm. There you go. So everyone switch off at the end of this, but not yet because we've got some more questions. Um, this is a, an interesting one, I think, as well, when we're talking about some of the things we've been discussing earlier. One way to engage leadership, you know, if you're talking about bringing in people from all over your organization, is like sharing your KPIs and reporting in your data. But then we're also kind of in a place where, you know, as Rosie was discussing earlier, we, we don't want to get too locked in those vanity metrics and things. How do you balance that and, and how do you use those to support your, your objectives? Yeah, so when I have done community management in the past, and this is, I guess, part of the difficulty, it was <laughs> the KPIs and the metrics that I thought were important weren't important to leadership. Um, and the KPIs and uh, metrics that they thought were important, I was like, well, why does this matter in any way, shape or form? And so actually what um, ended up happening in, in my instance was that actually we kind of just had to keep on having conversations until we kind of said yes you want these things but actually this is not what the community is saying mm. um and so in terms of hold on i've lost my thread the question is so about using kpis to discuss yeah, I these think things kpis are really important if you've been able to identify from the community actually what they're doing and what they need and have that conversation in um relation to leadership in terms of what they're looking for. Mm. I never worked for a, a company that was looking to like grow um, based off of their community. I was working in gated communities where actually they were looking to continue to add value to founders through like creating products, right? And I, I, I do that in this role as well. And so those KPIs there, it's more like how high is engagement? How, ma how many founders have said that they've spoken to other founders? And it's actually really hard to track introductions mm -hmm. and like conversations because then you just have to keep talking to people to do it. But we've managed it through looking at, um, yeah, how many interactions are happening within the people within our community. And then in terms of the product that we're providing, so the programs that we're providing, off the back of that, how much have the companies raised? How much um, employment? How many people have they employed? Because for us, it's really important that the programs we provide add value to the startups in order to help their businesses grow. And for us, that looks like funds raised and jobs created. Mm. Thank you. 
Um, this is one of the highest voted ones, so I'm quite excited to share it. Just like greenwashing, there's more and more kind of community washing. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, and how do you think it can be prevented? Ooh. Um, so my thoughts on like community washing are it's a terrible thing. And uh, as I said earlier, I'm really concerned about the way in which people continue to monetize communities for the sake of making money rather than the idea of creating value. And so forcing all these people that maybe use a product or have a conversation about something into a community isn't really fair. I think the way that that can be prevented is 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 more about again people i guess who are joining these communities really doing their research in terms of like what am i trying to get out of this community and then what can i contribute because i think very quickly it starts to become clear when a community isn't very helpful or useful and i think we just have to kind of let them fall apart not that i wish anything bad on anyone <laughs> no never but yeah sometimes we must bid a fair farewell <laughs> to these things um, I've got a couple more questions for you. Thank you so much. Um, what do you think is the best way to document community processes when the knowledge, you know, kind of what you're saying, it often lives within individuals. You know, how do you, it's like you're saying when you're talking about introductions and things like that, how do you glean and, and gather that information like a sort of squirrel with acorns? <laughs> I'm so sorry, that was actually very funny. Um, for me, what I've done, and I don't think I have this cracked in any way, shape or form, um, but I think for me, it's just, it's, it's creating that one source of truth that is actually easy for you to update in the very earliest stage. And I say that because again, I, I have not scaled a community, right? I've worked with communities that exist in one space. And so I think in terms of managing documentation, Notion is like my friend. I just really think that it's a, it's a useful place to be able to store things quite dynamically. Um, and then also asking the founders in um, my community where best they think or, or what platforms they use to create a single source of truth. Um, because otherwise, if you try to replatform people, it's, it's, it's not very helpful for them. I, I've been through that replatforming journey and I strongly concur. One last question for you, Precious, if that's okay. Um, would you recommend a, a book or a podcast on community other than, of course, Precious on Community, <laughs> the podcast that you should be listening to? And if you're not, I'm judging you. I mean, um, there are only five episodes, so it won't take you that long. But I, d I would say that actually I had some cool people in there and I learned a lot, so that's cool. Um, one podcast on community that I would um, recommend, I mean, um, what's it called? Get Together. Um, it's a podcast by uh, the people who started, I think, Creative Mornings and one other community. I literally was listening to it yesterday. But it's got like an orange... Um, podcast artwork it's called get together and basically they interview really great community uh, leaders everything from people who like uh created communities for nike for reddit um for all sorts so yeah get together podcast and there's a book too double whammy favorite book and podcast coming yeah, together in a single package everyone please give a huge hand to precious reality thank you so much for your insight